So thank you all for coming. We really do appreciate this. I think it's very important for us to have discussions not only about justice and peace in the Middle East, um, and especially about illegal occupation in Palestinian lands, but we also need to acknowledge that there is illegal occupation of indigenous lands here in Canada. And so I'd, I'd like us to keep that in mind as we're proceeding through these presentations. And I'd also like you to consider that right now we are on unceded, occupied lands of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish people. We have the honor of having Audrey Siegel, who is a Musqueam warrior woman. <laughs> And a, and a marvelous activist in her own right. And she is going to do us the honor of giving us our welcome. Thank you. I'm just going to leave it there. Thank you, Lisa. Um, first, thank you to the organizers, um, the, to the to St. James Hall for having us, for including me, for um, consistently doing good work and supporting so many different community-led initiatives because this is where change really happens. So, Mitsep Kotwilam, a Tanash with Mathguimach Tamoch Tanawail, Aik Gonishkwalowens Gunsi Kutsnala, Schem Tanak Gonishkwich Tanitzint, who Mathguim, Amahai Huikden, Itzlin August, Tanasit Lath. This is the Hunkaminum language that my people have spoken since the first sunrise. Scientists have dated us back 16,000 years, but um, we know it's longer. <laughs> and translation Welcome to the unceded lands of the Musqueam people. It gives me feelings of great joy to be here with you today. My name is Sklem also Audrey Siegel. I am from Musqueam. I am the daughter of the late Stephen and Selena August. And as Lisa said, on Turtle Island, right here in Vancouver, we know a little something about stolen land and occupation, about having our rights trampled, about having our sacred sites desecrated, about um, our voices being completely silenced because of an ongoing genocide. It's been happening on this coast for over 200 years. Any First Nations that exists here, especially a woman, it's nothing short of a miracle that we're still here. The government is still actively working to eradicate us off of our lands to gain full access to what is in the land and what is above the land and below the land. And until four years ago, I was asleep to all of it. They broke me and I managed to put myself back together and four years ago, I started, I started acting. I was thinking about the roots of the word activist because I kind of didn't like being called an activist because it's, it's been made dirty. And, um, and I thought activists, maybe someone who acts and I don't have a choice but to act. If I don't do something, who will? I sit around waiting for someone else to do it. That's never been the way I have worked. So to each of you who are here and acting, yourselves, participating, making the changes that you can, doing everything in your power each day, and I recognize it's a sliding scale. Some days the best I can do is get out of bed and keep going, other days I'm at the top of the mountain. <laughs> so each of you I say Hatsapka for being here, for, for caring, because it's a whole new world for me that people actually care about who I am and what my reality is as an Indigenous woman in Canada. Um, I stand in solidarity with all of the oppressed people, with all of the people who have ecocide and genocide forced upon them on top of displacement, on top of alienation, silencing, and um, the erosion of our rights. Nobody knows this land like my people do. We are in this land. That's how we know it's ours. It's not a legal document. It's not an oath. It's nothing I put my hand on, a, on, on any stack of books. I know this because I feel it. I don't feel this way anywhere else in the world. And there is something sacred in that. So the work that I do, some say, is political. And I, I don't mean to be flip, but I don't care if it's political. Politics gets in my way. So I do my best to work um, 
in ways that change those those realities that the politics of today's world and capitalist um, economy that we live in, to change it to adjust, to accommodate not me, but my ancestors. We had a way of thriving for 16,000 years and all of that except for 200 years that we've been here, we thrived. We knew about the land, we knew about, we had our own economy, we had our own commerce, we had our own language. Um, we did not have extinct species. We had battles, but we didn't have wars that carried on the way they do now. The value of a life was the highest priority. That's what I'm working back towards. I want, I will accept nothing less than the matriarchal roles and power being re, um, re-established here and my ancestors' matriarchal land. And not because I want the power, but because it's right. Our women have had the final say on these lands for 16,000 years. We work side by side with our men. It wasn't, a, it wasn't just a power thing. It was, as life givers, we have an understanding of nature that is different from from men because it is part of our gift and our magic to bear life. And I honor that and I respect that. So I'm very excited and interested to hear what each person has to say today. I'm excited to learn. I'm excited to build more networks. That's another big aspect of how I work. I, build, I want to be in an, um, I want to connect the dots everywhere I go. I want to empower people. I want you to know that we can still do this. Not all hope is not lost. It's hard to believe, especially when we look at the politics of the United States, and it's hard to believe it's not a cartoon. Like this is, this is, this is for real, and people glued to their TVs watching this drivel, dumbing themselves down. Um, I say free yourself, empower yourself, educate yourself, use the truth to liberate yourself and everyone around you, especially the women. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to, back to Lisa. Um, thank you all for being here. Oh, I forgot the song. <laughs> I forgot the song. I forgot the best part of all the song. So this is one of our paddle songs. This is a song I sing because we are on this journey together. For those of you who have just arrived here, I sing it to welcome you. And I also sing it um, to set the tone and the energy for the evening and the work that's to be done. He Thank you very much, Audrey. Audrey's going to be telling us a little bit more later on. Uh, we have a couple of very interesting speakers before Audrey. Dimitri Lascaris is the former justice critic for the Shadow Cabinet of the Green Party, uh, amongst other rather illustrious history that he's um, accumulated over the course of his professional life. Dimitri, I, I've been just so impressed with the stamina that Dimitri has exhibited pursuing this issue 
as a social justice issue, as a human rights issue, on principle. And I think that there's, you know, there's nothing that we can compromise on when it comes to human rights. There is a universal declaration of human rights, and universality is the underpinning of it. And so Dimitri has taken this issue that he brought forward to the Green Party of Canada, the motion that he put forward, I'm hoping that you'll elaborate on, on the motion, um, was passed three times by majority of Green Party members in various stages, bringing it forward to our general meeting in August. And immediately after the passing of that motion, everything hit the fan. And since that time, so that was August 7th, was it? Yeah, since August 7th, Dimitri has been essentially crossing the country back and forth and talking to people like you in town hall meetings about this very important issue. And so I think we're very lucky to have him stop by here in Vancouver, and I'd like you to give him a very warm welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa has become, in many ways, uh, my soul sister in this fight. Uh, I want to reiterate something that Audrey said, uh, not because I want the power, but because it's right. Uh, that's why we're here today, and I don't think that truer words were ever spoken. And all of the people across the country who have kindly come forward to give me their time and energies in this struggle for human rights remind me of that every day, that it's not about the power, but it's about what is right. This is my ninth town hall. Uh, I've so far had the privilege of meeting Canadians in uh, Montreal, Ottawa, four cities in Ontario, Winnipeg, which was a rather rambunctious affair, and then yesterday in uh, Victoria. In every town hall, I, I think I've learned more than I've imparted in terms of knowledge. So whatever happens uh, in Calgary, uh, I know that I will emerge from this a better human being, and for that I thank you all. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the situation in Palestine is often described as a conflict. And of course it is a conflict. But the word conflict is not uh, particularly enlightening because it imparts no understanding of the relative power of the belligerents, of the sides to the conflict. And when we look at the facts on the ground in Palestine, I think that we are drawn inexorably to one conclusion, and that is that the relationship between the state of Israel and the people of Palestine is one of oppressor to oppressed. I don't think that you can come to any other rational conclusion looking objectively at the facts. And why, why do I say that? And I'm not going to try to be exhaustive here, uh, but I, I'll highlight for you what I believe to be the more pertinent facts in understanding the power relationship between the sides to this conflict. The first is that, and perhaps the most obvious, is that the state of Israel and its citizens have had a sovereign state for approximately 70 years. Whereas at no time during that period have the Palestinian people, who under international law are as entitled to self-determination as any other people, have they had any sovereign state. And for nearly 50 years, yes, sorry. And for nearly 50 years, the Palestinian people have been occupied, not only stateless, but occupied. And as I said, throughout that period, uh, the people of Israel have had a sovereign state with all of the privileges that that entails, including, for example, freedom of movement and the freedom to determine domestic and foreign policy, amongst other freedoms and privileges. In addition, prosperity has been the condition under which uh, the people of Israel or at least the Jewish population of Israel have lived for much of the history of Israel, whereas poverty has been the state of affairs, largely speaking, for the Palestinian people. In 2014, the unemployment rate in Gaza established a world record of 47%. Nearly one in two persons, an unimaginable rate of unemployment, were unemployed. In that same year, the West Bank's unemployment rate, by comparison to Gaza, was downright uh, opulent, but nonetheless, compared to Western standards of unemployment approaching Depression-era levels at 
Uh, the most recent figures that I found for Israel were August 2016. The unemployment rate in Israel was 4.6%, which I believe is significantly lower than even the unemployment rate in our own country, one of the wealthiest countries in the, on the planet. Israel, interestingly, has the highest poverty rate in the OECD at 21%, almost double the OECD average of 11%. However, poverty in Israel falls disproportionately upon its Arab population. According to a March 2011 report by the Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel, over 50% of Arab families in Israel lived in poverty. And of the 40 towns in Israel with the highest unemployment rate, 36 were Arab. The Arab population has an employment rate that's little more than two-thirds of the employment rate for the Jewish population of Israel. In September 2014, the World Bank reported that 25%, one in four of the population of the occupied Palestinian territories lives in poverty. There can be no doubt that there is a grotesque disparity in military power. The State of Israel possesses the Middle East's only nuclear arsenal, and by the way, it refuses to accede to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Not only that, but it has the most advanced military weaponry in the world, supplied to it largely by the United States government, including advanced fighters and bombers, cruise missiles, drones, a navy, submarines, and uh, advanced attack helicopters, amongst other weapons, whereas the Palestinians, and particularly Hamas, uh, and I'm no fan of Hamas, I want to be clear about that, but what did they possess? By contrast, they have what Israel-Palestine scholar Norman Finkelstein describes as glorified fireworks, crude and notoriously inaccurate rockets. As one would expect in a situation of such disparate military power, the casualties on the two sides are also grossly disparate. In Israel's last three assaults on Gaza, nearly 4,000 Palestinians were killed, whereas 90 Israelis were killed. And of those 90 Israelis, 70 were soldiers, of whom four were killed by friendly fire. Of the nearly 4,000 Palestinians killed, over 550 were children. So the ratio of child deaths to all of the casualties on the Israeli side, Palestinian child deaths was in excess of five to one. In Israel's last assault, in 2014, nearly 3,400 Palestinian children were wounded, of whom over 1,000 were permanently disabled. And these children are having to be cared for in a society that is suffering from crushing poverty, as I said earlier, an unemployment rate of 47%, a world record. In these three assaults on Gaza, which the Israeli military disgracefully refers to as mowing the lawn, the overall ratio of Palestinian dead to Israeli dead was 40 to one approximately. How can anybody accept for one moment the proposition which is often peddled in the Western media that the Palestinian people are the aggressor in this conflict when they are suffering approximately 40 times the casualties of their opponents? There can be no doubt from a legal perspective that the settlements, which have been expanding relentlessly, violate international law. This was so held in 2004 by the Inter International Court of Justice unanimously, I might add, with the concurrence of the US judge. Multiple Security Council resolutions with the concurrence of the United States government so hold. Canada, the US, and the EU have all acknowledged that the settlements violate the Fourth Geneva Convention. And furthermore, Article I of the Fourth Geneva Convention requires the high contracting parties to undertake to respect and to ensure respect for the present convention in all circumstances. Our country is a signatory to this treaty. It has an obligation not only to respect the terms of the treaty itself, but also to ensure respect for the treaty in all circumstances of its close ally, Israel. And by failing to take steps that are within its power to take and that are necessary in order to ensure Israel's respect for international law, and by that I mean sanctions, our government is itself violating the Fourth Geneva Convention, and specifically Article One. What does Amnesty International have to say about the state of affairs for the Palestinian people, and I, I, I would think we could all at least agree that Amnesty International is a reputable human rights organization, not infallible by any means, but reputable. In the West Bank, and I'm quoting, including East Jerusalem, Israeli forces committed unlawful killings of Palestinian civilians, including children. Israeli military police and security forces, quote, tortured and otherwise ill-treated Palestinian detainees, including children, particularly during arrest and interrogation. Pausing there, our government is giving unequivocal support to a state 
that is torturing children. And it's doing this even though the torture is occurring, as Amnesty International notes in its most recent report, with impunity or virtual impunity. On numerous occasions, according to Amnesty International, journalists covering protests and other developments in the West Bank were assaulted or shot by Israeli police and military forces. In my capacity as a lawyer, I represent one of those journalists, a Palestinian Canadian named Rehab Nazal, and I'll come back to Rehab in a moment. In the West Bank, goes on amnesty, including East Jerusalem, Israeli forces demolished, and this is in one year, at least 510 Palestinian homes and other structures built without Israeli permits, which are virtually impossible to obtain. So you're a Palestinian living on territory allocated to you under the partition in the West Bank or East Jerusalem. You have to suffer the indignity of going to an external military power to obtain a permit in order to build on the land allocated to you under international law. It's virtually impossible to obtain that permit. And if you defy the external military authority, your house is likely to be demolished. That's the state of affairs under which Palestinians live. And Amnesty goes on and states, Israel, Israeli forces maintain their land, sea, and air blockade of Gaza in force since 2007, imposing collective punishment on the territory's 1.8 million inhabitants. Collective punishment, I assure you, is a violation of Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, as is torture, of course. So the settlements are not the only violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention being committed by our close ally, the State of Israel. Now, I mentioned Rehab Nazal. I went to the occupied territories in April and May of this year for the fourth time in my life. The first time I went there was in the, the 1980s. And I think it's fair to say at that point I was a student uh, in university and I decided to take a year off because I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and I just traveled across Europe and the Middle East by myself. And uh, something drew me, I think it was the history of the place to Israel. I think it's fair to say that at that time when I went to Israel, I very much bought, had bought into the narrative that we are sold here in the West by the corporate media and our political elites, namely that Israel is the Middle East's only democracy, that it's under assault from all sides, that the Palestinian people are the aggressor, that they're even inherently violent, and that the Israelis are doing nothing more than defending themselves in extraordinarily difficult circumstances in accordance with Western values. That was the narrative that I accepted. And I'm not going to give you the entire history of my own personal experience of the occupied territories, but I can tell you that over time during my four visits, my attitude changed quite dramatically, although it took some time for me to come to the realizations that I now have today. I went there this year not in order uh, to uh, deal primarily with the human rights violations being suffered by the Palestinian people, but because at that point in time I was a, a, a practicing lawyer, I've since retired, and I was representing uh, Eritrean, uh, nationals of Eritrea who had been forced to work against their will at the mine of a Canadian company called Nevsun Resources, which is headquartered here in Vancouver. They were effectively used as slave labor, and many of the uh, the Eritreans who had been forced to work at this mine had fled uh, across the border into Ethiopia through Sudan, uh, then across the Negev, and ultimately into Tel Aviv. So I went there to interview them. And they told me about the abuses that they have to endure living in Israel, which is not at all welcoming to refugees from Africa, regrettably. And when I finished my trip, I went to meet Rehab Nazal, whom I had agreed to represent on a pro bono basis several months earlier after she had been shot in Bethlehem in the leg by an Israeli sniper. What was she doing at the time that she had been shot? She was simply filming Israeli skunk trucks in Bethlehem that were spewing a noxious fluid onto the homes of Palestinians who were in their homes and who were no, posing no threat to anybody. And if you look here at the photograph, this is a photograph which Rehab shot just before she herself was shot with a different device. And if you look down, there's a jeep, and to the left, you'll see a black spot behind the wall. That is an Israeli soldier pointing a rifle at her. And he shot her while she was filming, as I mentioned. And she took me through the streets of central Bethlehem. But before I tell you what I saw there, we visited the outskirts of Bethlehem, and she wanted me to see something that I hadn't come to understand, namely that the wall is expanding, the separation wall. I thought the wall was done. I thought it was fixed and stationary, but it's not. It's relentlessly expanding and gobbling up Palestinian territory in violation of international law. And she introduced me to this gentleman, 
who's a 70-year-old Palestinian farmer living on the outskirts of Bethlehem. And what you see here is what remains of a grove, a lemon and olive grove that's been in his family for generations. He also has beehives in that grove. And behind the grove, you can see the wall coming down, surrounding his grove. He, he is now, his home is on the other side of that wall. We were able to go into the grove because on that day it was the Sabbath and the Israeli military was not active. Uh, the wall was not complete, so we walked through and he took us into the grove. And while we were there, he said to us, with tears in his eyes, they are breaking my connection to the land. And as a member of the Green Party, uh, that had a great effect on me. We then went back, Rehab and I, after speaking to this lovely gentleman, we went into the center of Bethlehem, and there, uh, at the end of the street where she had been shot, she so showed me this watchtower. Uh, this is right in the center of Bethlehem, which is now basically segregated, uh, physically so. And you'll see there an orange rectangle uh, in the lower right hand, left hand corner. That is uh, a window that opens up occasionally, as she explained to me, an Israeli sniper will point a rifle out of it and shoot peaceful protesters. Just behind us where we were standing at this moment was the shell of a building. And uh, she told me that that building had been in that uncom uncompleted state for some time because the Israeli forces had decided to use it as sort of a launching point for attacks on protesters. And we walked up to the second floor of this shell and we looked out and we saw there uh, parts of Bethlehem. And uh, as I was walking around the shell, I noticed that there were on the ground all around me spent tear gas canisters and I started gathering them up. And she explained to me that these tear gas canisters, uh, they're not just in the building, they're down in the street, have to be picked up every several days by uh, the Palestinian authorities because they're toxic, not just unsightly, but they're also toxic. But within a matter of several days, they're back there again en masse, and they have to be picked up every, every few days because they accumulate. And as I picked them up, I put them on this wall, and there were markings which made clear that these things, or some of them at least, had been manufactured in the United States. And as I was looking at them, I heard some children on the other side of the wall. And I looked over, and I saw these children. And as you can see, they're flashing the peace sign at me. And to me, it was the most extraordinary thing that children living in circumstances of absolute despair managed nonetheless to dream of peace and dignity and prosperity. And my fundamental reason for doing this, for everything that I've done, is that those children deceive, deserve those things as much as any of our children. And we have an obligation as a party that purports to defend social justice and respect for diversity and participatory democracy to do all that we reasonably can to help them to fulfill that dream. After Bethlehem, I uh, asked Rehab to take me to Hebron. And the reason I wanted to go to Hebron is because three months before my trip, I had watched an interview uh, during the APAC conference in Washington of Gideon Levy, an extraordinarily courageous Israeli journalist, journalist who writes for Haaretz, and he was interviewed by Max Blumenthal, uh, a Jewish American journalist who has been relentless in his criticism of the state of Israel. And Max asked Gideon, why do you always urge people to go to Hebron? And you'll see what uh, Gideon said was, I would start there because there you get it in a nutshell. There is no other place where you can see the Israeli policy, the Israeli apartheid in the West Bank in such crystal clear colors. Roads are just separated for Jews and for Palestinians, an empty town, and here he's talking about the commercial center of Hebron, because all the Palestinian inhabitants had to run away. I mean, the settlers terrorized them so much until most of them, there really remained only those who have no place to go. Uh, and you, you see the tyranny of the settlers, their brutality. They are the most extreme settlers, and they are part of them should be questioned by psychiatrists, I mean really, and only for a very small piece of land. And that's the way it could have and it will look one day if this occupation will continue. So you get it in a nutshell. So I wanted to see. And we started our visit to Hebron by going through the ancient part of the city, uh, which are just cobbled streets, there's no vehicular traffic. And what the first thing I noticed walking there was that there were plenty of merchants, plenty of shops, and no customers, absolutely none. I could see with my own eyes, this is a beautiful day in May, I could see it with my own eyes that the economy is being suffocated. So the merchants had lots of time to talk to us, and one of the things I noticed as we were chatting with them is that overhead uh, there was a mesh, and on the mesh there was what appeared to be trash, 
And I asked them what that was, and they said, well, th we've erected these nets because there are settlers living overhead, and they throw garbage down on our heads. So we've put the nets there to protect ourselves. However, uh, they've now taken to throwing down filthy water, and we've yet to devise a method to protect ourselves from that. We then entered, uh, we passed from the, the, the old center of Hebron into the commercial center, the more modern commercial center. We went through a checkpoint, which was beside the tombs of the patriarchs. This is what the checkpoint looks like. Both Rehab and I had Canadian passports because she's a Canadian citizen as well as a Palestinian. And uh, so we didn't get through, we didn't have much trouble getting through the checkpoint, but when we got about 10 meters beyond the checkpoint, we were approached by four heavily armed Israeli soldiers who demanded to see our passports again. And although Rehab had only been, had been shot in the leg some four or five months earlier, she actually quite courageously stood face to face, inches away from the Israeli soldier and demanded to know why she had to show her passport again. And initially he refused to answer, but eventually there in front of me he said, because only Jews can walk here. He wasn't even embarrassed to say that. There was a clear policy of apartheid segregation unfolding before our very eyes. But she had a Canadian passport, so he allowed us ultimately, after some dispute, to proceed. And as we were walking through the streets, we saw these walls over and over again between buildings, and these walls are there to segregate the Palestinian population from the settler population. The Palestinian population is on the opposite side of this wall. And I was told as I was uh, visiting another part of the West Bank in a subsequent part of my trip by a German national who works for an NGO in the West Bank. He told me he had extensive experience working in Hebron. And he said to me that the children who live on the other side of this wall, in order, some of them, in order to go to school, these are children who are, you know, grade school age, uh, they have to cross the commercial center. I mean, the city wasn't designed in a way to be segregated, uh, so they have to cross the commercial center to get to their school. Uh, and because they are subjected to so much abuse by the settlers, they have to be accompanied by uh, representatives of NGOs. And then once when they're in the school, they've been delivered there safely by the persons accompanying them, Oftentimes, Israeli soldiers who are armed will come into the classrooms and will demand to see their hands for, and looking for evidence that they've been throwing stones. And if in the judgment of those soldiers, there's evidence that they have been throwing stones, the children will be arrested and removed from the classroom. As we were walking around, I continuously saw this poster. And uh, I happened to recognize uh, this individual because it was a story that I had been following. What the poster says is freeettinger.com. Mayor Ettinger is a fanatical West Bank settler who was accused by the Israeli government of having firebombed the home of a Palestinian family in 2015. And in the firebombing, an 18-month-old Palestinian baby was burned to death. The parents were also extensively burned and ultimately succumbed to their wounds. And the sole survivor of that attack was the four-year-old brother of that baby. Uh, who was badly burned, as you can imagine, uh, irrevocably traumatized, I'm sure. And these settlers feel that Mayor Ettinger, accused of having committed this heinous attack, ought to be liberated. And the posters were everywhere. And you'll never see this of course, reported, of course, in the Western media. Any reporter from the West could go and see the same things that I saw. But there's not a word of that in the National Post, the Globe and Mail, nothing. Now, what does our party have to say about this so-called conflict? In the Vision Green document, it is stated, the Green Party of Canada believes that any effort aimed only at one side in this conflict will not end the violent responses that exacerbate human suffering. It's hard for me to articulate without, while remaining respectful, the degree to which I disagree with this statement. It is profoundly misguided, it is wrong, and it is cowardly. Let me be clear, it is cowardly. I prefer the sentiments of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who said, I have witnessed the systemic humiliation of Palestinian men, women, and children. Their humiliation is familiar to all black South Africans. In South Africa, we could not have achieved our democracy without the help of people around the world who through the use of nonviolent means such as boycotts and divestment, encouraged their governments and other corporate actors to reverse decades long support for the apartheid regime. If you are neutral, in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. This should be obvious to us all. If one side has disparately, uh, uh, grotesquely disparate power and is using it brutally to suppress the other side, and you stand back and you say, 
I'm adopting a position of neutrality, you are clearly enabling the oppressor. We have an obligation to stand with the oppressed. We have a moral obligation. As I'll explain, we have a constitutional obligation in our party. We have a legal obligation under international law. And that's all we've done in the Green Party by adopting this resolution. What does the resolution say? It says, the GPC supports the Green Party of Canada, supports the use of divestment, boycott, and sanctions that are targeted to those sectors of Israel's economy and society which profit from the ongoing occupation of the OPT. So I'll pause there. It's been said that this is anti-Israel. We're not arguing that all sectors of Israel's society should be subjected to sanctions, boycott, and divestment. There are people within Israel who, who are fiercely opposed to the occupation. For example, the human rights organization, B'Tselem, the extraordinarily courageous ex-soldiers of the IDF who make up breaking the silence, and many others, just average citizens. They're opposed. Why should we subject them to sanctions? That's not what we call for. There are people within Israel, people of conscience, who say, no, this is not to be done in our name. We are only targeting those sectors of the economy and society which profit from a brutal occupation. And furthermore, we say we will revisit in the second clause the support for BDS, or party support for BDS, upon the happening of two events. First, there is a permanent halt implemented to settlement construction and expansion. And second, the commencement of good faith negotiations with the Palestinian people with a view to the creation of a viable sovereign Palestinian state. Now, we could have gone much further, quite reasonably, and we could have said, you know, after decades of sham negotiations in which the Israeli government has relentlessly confiscated Palestinian land until almost nothing is left to them and they're living in these squalid Bantu stands, we're going to demand that you actually give them a state before we withdraw our support for BDS. But we didn't go that far. We said, we're going to give you the benefit of the doubt, effectively. You stop expanding those settlements permanently, enter into negotiations, we will revisit our support for BDS. And finally, something that I think we should all be able to agree with, notwithstanding the disgraceful resolution adopted in our parliament condemning supporters of BDS and effectively equating them with anti-Semitism, we say that people should not be prohibited or deterred or punished for expressing support for BDS. This is whatever your view may be about BDS. Surely we can all agree as a matter of free speech that we have the right to express our opinions on this issue. That's it. That's our resolution. That's our divisive, polarizing resolution. How did the mainstream media react? On the day of the adoption, the Globe and Mail vote to support Israel boycott campaign divides the Green Party. I was interviewed by the author of this article immediately after the vote at the, at the convention, Sean Shilikoff. And, you know, I must have spent a good 15 minutes uh, talking to him about the basis of my support for BDS. Of course, it was all human rights related. Not a word about human rights violations by the State of Israel appeared in this article. Not one word. And in fact, I did a radio interview in my own city, London, Ontario, two weeks later. This is a God's honest truth. Before I, uh, after I agreed, the producer sends me an email and he says, we don't want you talking about Israel's human rights record. I said, okay, well, I'm not going to pay any attention to him. So I get on the radio program, and the first thing I did was I started talking about Israel's human rights violations. And the talk show host cuts me off. He goes, oh, we didn't want to talk about that. I said, well, no, I'm going to talk about it. I had a similar experience dealing with a radio host in Montreal. He literally tried to stop me from talking about the human rights violations of the state of Israel. It's as though it was a taboo. This is not to be discussed. What did the National Post say the next day of the, after the adoption? Green Party's boycott Israel policy totally unhelpful to peace, ambassador to Canada says. As you can imagine, that wasn't an ambassador on behalf of the Palestinian people. No, that was the Israeli ambassador. Did the National Post, in either that article or the one that was authored on August 10th, which had a similar headline, did they ask a representative of the Palestinian people what they thought about this? No. Not at all, because in the world of post-media, the voices of the Palestinian me uh, people have no value. They're not worthy of being reported to us. The Toronto Star, the supposed progressive newspaper of Canada on August 15th, rather than fleeing the scene of its political car crash over policy on Israel, Elizabeth May should stick around and save her party from itself. At least I will say this, Linda McQuaig, who writes for the Toronto Star, gave the only balanced account 
of this entire debate in the mainstream media in Canada. So I don't include her in my condemnation of the Toronto Star. But otherwise, when it comes to the people of Palestine, it is no progressive newspaper. I can assure you of that. The Hamilton Spectator on August 18th, the Greens' big, big mistake in Elizabeth May. You may see that there's a theme running through these articles. The theme is the party's destroying itself. Not somebody has stood up bravely for the, a devastated people who are being uh, abused every day by our close ally Israel. Not there's a legitimate question here about how you deal with these human rights violations. It was all about our party supposedly destroying itself. There were, however, voices that had a very different perspective. Tyler Levitan of Independent Jewish Voices stated in a press release the following day on August 8th, this is the first time a Canadian political party with representation in the House of Commons has taken a strong and positive position in solidarity with the grassroots Palestinian movement for freedom, justice, and equality. And Tom Woodley on the same day for Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East said, by voting overwhelmingly in support of the BDS resolution, Green Party members demonstrate their deep concern for the human rights of Indigenous Palestinians. I challenge you to find either of these statements in any mainstream media outlet, including the CBC, our state broadcaster. These voices don't matter. They're not to be heard. We are not, as it happens, alone, even though we're being characterized as fringe extremists who've gone off the deep end. In 2005, more than 10 years ago, the Green Party of the United States and that's, of course, a country in which hostility to BDS is no less intense than it is here, and perhaps even more intense, whose leader is Jewish, stood very clearly, not just in support of an aspect of the BDS movement as we have done, they embraced the entire BDS movement, and I'm going to come back to that. So, too, has the UK Green Party years ago. And there, too, the, in, the hostility to BDS is no less intense than it is here. And the Scottish Green Party even went so far in his resolution supporting the BDS movement to describe Israel as a racist apartheid state, which indeed it is. But when I drafted this resolution, I did not use those words. I avoided words like racism, apartheid, uh, Zionism, war crimes, which clearly are being committed there, crimes against humanity. All of that is absent from our resolution. It is the minimum that human decency requires. There's nothing excessive or divisive or polarizing about it. We, as a matter of human decency, must support this. Does the policy single out Israel? This is an oft-repeated criticism. Well, in 2014, the Green Party of Canada, quote-unquote, singled out Saudi Arabia, and rightly so, by calling for a ban on military exports to that heinous regime. And that's a full two years before we brought forward the BDS resolution. And I myself in the 2015 election as a candidate in London West was vociferously clamoring for a cancellation of the $15 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia. There are four ridings in my city. I was the only candidate who did that. And we were told by General Dynamics, which manufactures those military vehicles in our city, that they account for 3,000 jobs and we have one of the highest unemployment rates in Ontario. But as a matter of conscience, we cannot sell arms to war criminals. It was as simple as that. Now, when I took that position, and when the Green Party took that position in 2014, did anybody say that we were unfairly singling out Saudi Arabia? Did anybody say that we were Islamophobes, that we were anti-Arab? Nobody, not inside our party, not outside our party, ever leveled that allegation at our party or at me in the campaign. A very wise gentleman by the name of Michael Lesher, who is an Orthodox Jew and a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, wrote an article a few weeks ago in which he said that there is a double standard in the case of Israel. But this is how the double standard operates. Only when you criticize Israel's human rights record are you expected to yoke together with your condemnation of that state a condemnation of all other human rights violators on the planet. But when you shine a bright light on the human rights violations of any other actor, any other state actor, that's permissible. So when Netanyahu complains of a double standard, yes, there is a double standard, but it operates to the advantage of the state of Israel, not to its disadvantage, as we're led to believe by Netanyahu. Furthermore, our state is not, in fact, neutral vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian people and Israel. We subsidize, for example, and I'm just giving you a, a handful of facts to demonstrate that lack of neutrality. We subsidize the racist Jewish National Fund, which holds 13% of the land in Israel and explicitly refrains from allocating, leasing, selling land to non-Jews in the state of Israel. 
The Israeli Attorney General himself, a former Israeli Attorney General, opined that this organization is discriminatory, and yet we accord to it charitable status and effectively subsidize its activities in this country. And we've been doing that for a long time. Dozens of Canadian corporations sell military and surveillance equipment and technology to the State of Israel. In the UN, Canada has repeatedly taken one-sided votes in favor of the State of Israel. Just look at the question of the sovereignty of Palestine, the recognition of the State of Palestine. Of 193 UN member states, 136 constituting over 70% have recognized the State of Palestine as of September 2015. The population of these states is over 5.5 billion people, equaling 80% of the world's population. There is, by any rational measure, very strong broad-based support internationally for recognition of the State of Palestine, but our supposedly neutral country refuses to recognize the State of Palestine. The situation, the lack of neutrality, is even more flagrant in the case of the United States. Only weeks ago, the U.S. State Department announced the largest military aid package in U.S. history, $38 billion to Israel over the course of 10 years. What did Gideon Levy have to say about this? $300 for each U.S. taxpayer for the next 10 years, not toward America's considerable social needs, not to assist, assist truly needy countries. Imagine what $38 billion would do for Africa but to provide weapons for an army that is one of the most powerfully armed in the world, one which methodically defies the U.S. and the international community. And prophetically, within a matter of days, the war criminal Netanyahu announced that they were building yet another settlement in the West Bank. The U.S. government, as we've seen very often in the past, strongly condemned this announcement, yet has given us no indication that it's going to reduce that $38 billion aid package by so much as a single dollar. Impunity for the state of Israel, accountability for other states. That's the double standard. Now, it's been said that we endorse the BDS movement, and this we ought not to do, because we don't control the movement. They might adopt policies, tactics, which aren't in accordance with our values. That's what we're told. Is this fair? Well, uh, in 2015, after the election, I was at COP 21 uh, in, a in my capacity as a journalist for the Real News Network, something that I do on a part-time basis. And I asked Elizabeth May uh, if she might accord me 15 minutes of her time for an interview. And what I really wanted to talk to her about is that I had reservations at that point in time about our commitment to the kinds of profound and dramatic changes that I think the global economy requires in order for us to avoid a climate catastrophe. I had reservations about our party's commitment because I see elements of our party's platform that are not particularly progressive. And I see a certain hesitancy on the part of our party's leadership to recognize the dramatic economic changes that we require in order to prevent a climate catastrophe. And so I did a little research. I looked at the signatories of the Leap Manifesto and I saw that Elizabeth May's name wasn't there, nor was the name of the Green Party of Canada. And so my interview, in my interview of her, and you can see this on YouTube, it's on the Real News website, about eight minutes in, I say to her, you know, I looked at the Leap Manifesto I didn't see your name there. Without any hesitation, Elizabeth May said, we endorse the Leap Manifesto and we're the only party in Parliament to do so. She was very proud of that fact. It reassured me. Well, my friends, I have news for you. The Leap Manifesto is a social movement. It's the expression of the will of a social movement. Its founders, its drafters are in no way beholden to the, Le the, the, the Green Party of Canada. And all the concerns that we've heard expressed about the endorsement of the BDS movement apply equally to the Leap Manifesto. Nobody has explained why it's legitimate for us to endorse a social movement that is environmentally related, but not to endorse a social movement that's focused on human rights. Because there is no explanation. There is no legitimate distinction between those, those two endorsements. As it happens, however, we don't actually endorse the BDS movement. The BDS movement has three goals. One of them is ending the occupation and the colonization of all Arab lands, which it defines as, as to include the Golan Heights. Our resolution says nothing about the Golan Heights. It does call for an end to the occupation of the settlements, but it doesn't talk about the Golan Heights. Second goal of the BDS movement recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality. There are over 50 racist laws in Israel. There is an effectively an apartheid regime in place in Israel itself. The economic statistics, by the way, bear this out, as I hope you'll agree. Now, why anybody would have any problem with our party supporting full equality for Arab citizens of Israel, I don't know. But as a matter of fact, that's not what our resolution talks about. It says nothing about that. And the third right, 
or demand of the BDS movement is the right of return of Palestinian refugees, many of whom have spent their entire lives in squalid refugee camps with no end in sight. Why anybody in our party would have any problem with the notion that people who were forcibly removed from their homeland should be afforded the opportunity to return in a just manner, I don't know. I don't know why anybody would have a problem with that. I certainly support it, but that's not what our resolution says. It says nothing about the right of return. So we have the Green Party of the United States and the Green Party of the UK fully endorsing all of these movements, all of these objectives, fully endorsing the use of BDS in order to achieve these objectives that we haven't even gone that far. Now, as uh, my good friend Lisa Barrett, who has uh, been tireless in her support of this resolution and who with me uh, chose to be removed from shadow cabinet rather than uh, to apologize merely for defending in a respectful manner our support for BDS or our limited support for BDS. Uh, she talked about the fact that our leader had threatened to resign. This happened within two days of the convention uh, on the weekend of August uh, 6th and 7th. In the wake of that threat of resignation, the Federal Council, in an in-camera meeting, which for reasons that have not been explained to us, we were not permitted as members of the party to observe, not even members of shadow cabinet were permitted to observe, they decided that they're going to hold another meeting. And the meeting's gonna take place in December 3rd and 4th in Calgary. Why Calgary, we really don't know. I can think we can all agree that Calgary is not likely to be the most favorable political ground for us to have this fight on. And a lot of people from Ontario and Quebec who voted for this res resolution have said to me very clearly that they simply can't afford to go. And the party has decided that they cannot participate in that meeting despite my strenuous objections electronically. So as an economic matter, those people are going to be excluded from the decision making in Calgary. That's just the practical reality. I've been called upon as has Lisa to participate in discussions with the shadow cabinet despite our ex expulsion with a view to trying to achieve a consensus resolution. And we have both agreed, notwithstanding, and I think I speak for both of us when I say this, our belief that this entire meeting is illegitimate and the circumstances in which it was called are illegitimate. We've agreed for the sake of our party to participate in those discussions and they're gonna take place in this city towards the end of the month. If we cannot receive, achieve a consensus, however, then there's going to have to be a decision made by the members in Calgary in early December about whether to preserve this, this resolution or not. Only people who are members of the party for at least 30 days uh, prior to that vote will be eligible to vote. And if you are a member of the party or thinking about becoming one and you can't go to Calgary, you could still have a role to play because we are told that after Calgary, there's going to be an online ratification vote and any decisions that are taken there are going to be subjected to a ratification vote in which people will be able to participate electronically from the comfort of their homes. So you could still play a role, but again, you would have to be a member of the party for at least 30 days prior to that vote. If you wanna become a member of the party, I ask you not to do it simply because you want to defend Palestinian rights. There are many ways you can defend Palestinian rights. Uh, if you want to become a member of our party, I say to you that you really need to be on board with our core values. You know, if that's the case, if you are on board with our core values, if these values represent who you are and you want to defend the human rights of the Palestinian people, then by all means join our party. I encourage you to do so. What are those values? As you can see them up on the screen, ecological wisdom, social justice, participatory democracy, nonviolence, sustainability, and respect for diversity. These are fundamentally progressive values. Our party is constitutionally progressive. And this is very important because we've heard over and over again that this little issue of the destruction of Palestinian rights is outside of our core mission. Our core mission being the environment and climate change. Well, there's no doubt that those are two very, very important issues to which we should continue to devote very substantial resources and efforts. But look at our values. There's no reference to climate change and in fact, Four out of the six values don't say anything about sustainability, the, the environment, or ecology at all. Social justice, participatory democracy, nonviolence, and respect for diversity are fundamentally human rights related values. Our party is not just a one trick pony, an environmental champion. We are also constitutionally mandated to defend human rights. That is at the core of our mission, 
and the BDS policy is a fulfillment of our core mission. What are specific examples for those of you thinking of joining the party of our values in action? We oppose democracy destroying trade deals like the TPP and CETA. Fortunately, it appears that uh, the Belgians are going to kill the CETA agreement <laughs> because we, we can't rely upon our own supposedly progressive government to do that. We oppose all tar sands pipelines. We oppose the, the heinous anti-terror law, Bill C-51, which is a frontal assault on our civil liberties. We want a guaranteed livable income for all Canadians, post-secondary education to be tuition free. And we're the only party with representation in Parliament to have opposed the bombardment of Libya, a disastrous intervention which has resulted in yet another failed state and exacerbated an unprecedented refugee crisis in the Mediterranean. Shame on the three major parties for supporting that disastrous intervention. So if these are your values, and if those are policies that appeal to you, and you want to defend this important victory for human rights, then I urge you, if you are not already a member of our party, to become one before November 2nd, and if you can, to come to Calgary and to help us to defend this victory. Uh, you can join the Green Party of Canada by making a $10 donation. For one year, you become a member with that. Of course, I encourage you, if you want to do this, to don donate more if you're able. Uh, but once you've done that, you can do it online in a matter of minutes. You will have the right to participate in these votes. And I would also ask, if you're interested in following the progress of our campaign to support the Green Party of Canada's BDS resolution, that you go to our Facebook group page, which is entitled just that, Support the Green Party of Canada's BDS resolution. And whatever you do, whether or not you want to defend this victory through membership in the party, I ask that you remember these children and that you fight for their dream and their rights by whatever means available to you, whether or not you are or wish to become a member of the Green Party of Canada. Thank you.